Um, hi everyone, welcome to the stream. So uh, today is the fifth episode of our programming talk show, and today uh, we will discuss AG, which is the Silver Sorcerer, and Full Beats with uh, Jeff Greer. And, Hello. Yeah, uh, I hope you can hear Jeff. Uh, let me know about this. Okay. So, so sometimes there are some issues, weird issues. Okay. Um, I think that it should be fine. Uh, okay, so the sound is good. Thanks. Uh, so basically, uh, I have a bunch of different questions. Uh, there is no fixed uh, agenda or there is no fixed plan. Uh, so I'm going to ask them in semi-random order. And uh, the whole point of doing this live is so you uh, viewers can ask uh, questions in chat. So I'm crossing into three services with one first one. Um, is it easy to work in? Let me check this. Let me check this real quick. I'm not sure though. I think it should be working. Anyway, um, yeah, let me hit start recording. Okay, so. So, okay, uh, I'm not sure if YouTube is working, but whatever. I'm just going to upload it later. Um, yeah, six people on Twitch. So, most of the time I will pay attention to chat and watch people code, but I will also take. Uh, Sometimes take a look at Twitch chat and uh, YouTube chat. Although YouTube is not working today for some reason, I'm recording this uh, video though. So, yeah. Okay, let's start. Uh, so, um, okay, the, my first question is: uh, is uh, how did you start learning programming? What was your first language? What was your first program? Um, probably. Uh, kindergarten. You know, remember the programming language logo? Yeah, I didn't remember it was that. like the little turtle that you have to. Yeah, uh, that was on like an Apple something, and the, I think I got hooked at that point. And after that, I was like QBasic. And then when I was twelve, I started learning C, and then I've just been doing that ever since. <laughs> so uh, you started learning C at twelve. This is impressive. I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> I started learning log in, uh, in at twelve, so um, and C at eighteen. So yeah, oh, this is cool. impressive. Yeah, um, so I do do you program mostly in C. Uh, nowadays, it's mostly JavaScript and Python mm -hmm. because that's what Flubits is written in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, C is like my hobby. It's, it's like if you're like whittling a piece of wood in your spare time, it's like that now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's fun, but not not very productive. <laughs> Okay, um, what's your opinion on C++? I mean, uh, do you like it or do you hate it? Um, I wish there was a book called C++ the right or the good parts, kind of mm -hmm. like JavaScript the good parts, and a subset of C++ is pretty useful, but uh, everybody seems to disagree on what that subset <laughs> is right now. Uh, and so, yeah, you, you can really you know shoot yourself in the foot with C++ sometimes. This is but, true. But at the uh, same it's a useful language, yeah. But at the same time, memory management is, is like a uh, very difficult thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, smart pointers and, and that sort of stuff. And the things that have been built on top of C++, like Boost, those are just, yeah, crazy useful sometimes. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, okay, uh, I have a bunch of different questions. Some of them are open-ended, some of them less open-ended. And the first thing I'd like to ask you about is something like your insane GitHub streak, because uh, <laughs> I noticed your comments on Hacker News, and you mentioned that you have a streak close to 900, I think. Days. Yeah, it's 885 days right now. <laughs> this is insane. I mean, and, uh, how do you keep uh, working on it? And not missing um, a single day. I mean... Yeah, and these aren't just like white space changes or like linter changes. It's actually writing mm -hmm. code that is going to go into production at some point. Uh, so I don't know. It's it's like a habit. It's like an exercise, like running. Um, I I don't have a running streak that's that long, but because I it's easy to get injured. But uh, it's just you know, uh, it's I'm almost compelled to do it at this point. After the first like hundred days, like. It was just really easy to keep going, and some of my pride is tied up into it, so I can't I can't slack now because people will ask me about my GitHub streak, and then I'll be like, oh, I, I it's zero now because I <laughs> like I can't I can't have that happen. So like okay, I, I went on a camping trip 
two weeks ago, and I brought my laptop with me and made some commits, like, out in the woods. Can't, can't have that streak break. <laughs> so it's sort of like social pressure, peer pressure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so do you have any particular rule about commits? Like, uh, you have to make non-white space changes or uh, not, not updating with me or not creating, you know, issues? Yeah, it has to be real code, um, and, and so that means yeah, like not not just little. It, it has to be actual code that changes mm-hmm. logic, I guess. Not just readmes and stuff. I mean, some of my commits are that, but every day I have one of those. It is. I mm-hmm. also have some commit that is real code. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so about AG, um, the first thing is like, how did you decide to write AG? I mean, I started using this tool a uh, few. By the way, okay, a bit, little bit about AG. It's uh, an amazing tool. It's like a better grab for code, and I started using it a few weeks ago. And I should have started using it much earlier uh, <laughs> because it's better. I mean, I don't have to like pipe two grabs that one of them filters like you know dot JIT or dot SVN, um, and it feels faster. I mean, it's like all faster than grab. Um, so okay, so how did you decide to write? AG, because I know that there is this tool AAC or ACK. ACK, yeah, it's called ACK. Um, I think that's a reference to some comic. There's this character that always mm-hmm. says ACK. Uh, so that was um, uh, Andy Lester. He wrote that in Perl in the, like 2008 ish. And I'd been using it for a while, mm-hmm. and a code base at work finally got so big that ACK was slow. Uh, and I'm like, oh man, well, it, so in my free time, I, I thought I could write like a clone of ACK in C, uh, and make it a little faster and obey some of my preferences, like obeying git ignores. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that was in December of 2012 when I started that and it took off really quickly. Uh, I was surprised that other people had the same problem where grep is too annoying to use. The, the defaults don't don't yeah. work well for searching code and ACK is written in Perl so and it's single threaded so it's it's not super fast but it ignores a lot of files so it's it's pretty good at, at being faster than grep mm-hmm. and so yeah ever since then I've just been slowly like you know brushing up uh, on it every once in a while uh, it's been a good hobby to just figure out how uh, how to make a program faster to profile it figure out what's slow, optimize that bottleneck. Uh, I've got a bunch of blog posts, and I link to them in the AG README uh, so that you can see, like, oh, I figured out how to use, like, PCRE's JIT mode to make it faster, or I added pthreads so that I use all CPU cores instead of just one, uh, or I, I wrote my own, like, Scander implementation that's faster than the one that, like, comes with libc, all, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, what's like like what what is okay? So the question is this. Um, okay, the first question is: it really faster than, than grep, or is it my you know impression? Uh, so I use so it's it depends on what you're searching, mm-hmm. but most of the time it's faster, and the reason for that is that grep. You know, grep dash r or whatever will mm-hmm. search all kinds of files. It won't ignore like minified JS if you have that in your, you know, mm-hmm. git ignore. Uh, and grep by default is single threaded, so mm-hmm. it will search. It will use up one CPU core and search all your things sequentially, mm-hmm. and give you results in the order it traverses them. So AG is multi threaded, so I use all your CPU cores to search. Um, and I use a, uh, a string string algorithm called Boyer Moore uh, string string, which is more efficient than like the standard string string that comes in libc. Mm-hmm. Uh, so most of the time, it's way faster. If you're searching a single file, then you can't use multiple threads, or it's harder. And I don't. So uh, so then ag single threaded, grep is single threaded, and grep has a clever uh, string string algorithm that assumes it's not going to match. It's a, uh, so it uses a, a special string, a string string algorithm that if there's actually a match, it's, it's slower, but most of the time it assumes there's no match, so it ends up being faster 
in most cases because you're searching for a very specific thing most of the mm -hmm. time, and most files won't contain it. So single file is probably slower. Also, uh, I print line numbers, and grep doesn't. So AG will, you know, you have to count all the new lines in the file. So that means you have to literally go through the file, search every character, like, oh, is that a new line? And come in. And so that's slower. And so when mm -hmm. it's printing out, it'll be slower. So single file, uh, grep is faster. OK. Um, so uh, are there any cool hacks in the code? Like maybe we could talk about some of the uh, most interesting hacks. Because, for example, I haven't read that blog post, but I think you uh, wrote your own scan deal or something like that. Yeah. Um, just a sec. And probably let me go dig up either the GitHub link or okay. Actually, if it's in Flubits, you can follow me along. If you, yeah. Oh, where's the chat thing? Oh, okay. there it is. Yeah, I can send it to you. Okay, so if you go there, um, you'll probably be able. Okay. Um... Yeah, I'm going to oh, add the yeah. link, which is uh, fullbeats.com slash tgreer slash ag. Yeah, so if you visit that in a browser, you'll probably see um, yeah, the, the web editor of Flubits, and you'll see you know me messing around in uh, the ag thing. So I think it's scan... Scander.c, here we go. Uh, so yeah, I have my own scander because so the normal scander function, its prototype does not have what is called a baton, which you you, know, you pass the baton to the next thing, uh, and so it's it's much harder to to use it to like filter a function when you want state uh, in the filter. So the place where I call this. Uh, oh, and of course it has some terrible hacks for like Windows and Sigwin. And I think I removed the Solaris hack, where for some reason size of durant on Solaris was one, which is never going to work. Like the struct is definitely bigger than like one byte. Uh, but I, I think sorry, Solaris users, all two of two of you. <laughs> so I call Scander over in there's this file called search.c, and I think this function is called search dir. Uh, and so Scander takes a little Scander baton struct, which normal Scander doesn't have that. Uh, and that struct contains like some ignore patterns and a base path that you're searching. And then I you know, compute string length once instead of uh, like calculating it every time I want to know the length of that base path. Uh, so the filter function is the other handy thing, which I think that's in... Mm -hmm. Ignore C, and I've got a big angry thing at the top. Like, yeah, this function is really hot. It gets called for every file, and that takes like a path. And the durant, which is what Scander uses, and then the baton, which is the normal C libc Scander doesn't have this, but I do. And that's really handy for. Uh, yeah, this whole like ignore pattern thing, because that changes based on, um, like sometimes you want to ignore at a certain level, and sometimes you want you only care about like ignore patterns in the subdirectory, and so you can speed things up if you only pass the ignores that you need, and only search those, uh, as opposed to using all of the ignore patterns. Uh, you know, even when you're down in like some tiny little directory that's really deep. So that's that's the main optimization that you can't do with a normal libc uh, scander. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the things that I do in my spare time, I guess, because I I don't get paid for AG. Like, <laughs> uh, by the way, how many people are work, working on AG? Like, how many people did something uh, significant? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, ex excluding you. I mean, or, or including you. Maybe like a. A dozen at most, but uh, if you look at the code, most of it's written by me. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while, it's fun to like pair with other people. Uh, but at, at this point, 
uh, most of the thing like AG is kind of done, and the only things left are features that people want that will destroy performance if implemented. <laughs> so I mostly just have to like tell them, sorry, I, this is gonna like it will make it really really slow. Sorry, uh-huh. uh, or there are features that I just don't really care about, so they don't get implemented because nobody else people want them, but they don't know how to write them. And I'll help them, but I can't like I'm if I if I don't really care about it, I've got other stuff to do, so I won't implement that feature. Like, okay. Um, okay. So you mentioned uh, profiling, like, and how do you how did you optimize the performance? Like, what tools did you use? Oh, uh, so mostly so Valgrind. Uh, that one was really handy at first. Then Gprof on Linux. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Valgrind is an uh, like an instrumenting uh, 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 profiler. So it replaces like malloc and free and other functions. Uh, and it didn't, like the the only annoying thing about Valgrind is it will say something's using up a ton of CPU, but uh, because everything runs like 50 times slower in Valgrind, you won't always, like, say you'll, you'll make like a 20x improvement, or you think it's 20x improvement, and it, so it's, it says it's 20 times faster in Valgrind. That'll correspond to like being three times faster in the real world, because most stuff in like in AG is not CPU limited. But Valgrind is only looking at CPU usage because of all that overhead. So uh, yeah, a lot of time is spent in uh, disk I.O. or whatever. Okay, oh, yeah, this is actually interesting. I mean, I never noticed this uh, thing with, with the ball grind, probably because I never worked on, like, uh, I want tens of programs. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I use Gprof next. And uh-huh. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's much nicer because like, it just pulls the program counter, like, every, you know, 100 times a second or something to figure out what's, you, you know, where the, C, where the CPU is spending its time. Uh, and that's, yeah, gives you an accurate representation of oh, I'm spending all my time in like you know fread or something, uh, and then finally I started using instruments.app because I'm on a Mac, so I, it's just con- it's super convenient. It's uh, it's basically like a nice GUI on top of uh, Dtrace, and yeah, I I, I really like it. Uh, I've got a few blog posts where I like show off the. Uh, um, like the output of instruments.app. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I use it for everything now, like finding memory leaks, um, finding, like, yeah, see, uh, performance issues, and just uh, being curious sometimes in, t- in terms of, like, uh, you know, how, like if I try this, will it make it faster or slower? Most of the time it makes it slower and I have to throw the code away, but it's, you know, learn something from it. But like, there's an example of how I I uh, like added p threads to AG, and I used instruments.app to find that a uh, worker thread model is way better than a uh, thread per file model. Mm-hmm. So okay. yeah. Okay, so um, I think I think I don't have much questions about AG, but people started asking. Questions about uh, Flubits and uh, yeah, let's talk about Flubits. Uh, yeah. First question from chat is what is the Flubits website written in? Uh, so the front end, the you know the HTML you see is generated by uh, Django, so that's all Python um, and then like Postgres backend and stuff. And then all of our uh, operational transformation code and persistent connections, like our server code for that is written in uh, N- Node.js, but we use IOJS. Mm-hmm. And we use a lot of uh, C++ modules. So the, like most of the time the CPU is in C++ land uh, instead of like JavaScript JIT land. Uh, so yeah, it's most, most of it. Okay, so by the way, why IOJS? I know I never really used Node.js, but I heard there was some um, some split between Node.js and IOJS, and I think they are going to merge together at some point in the future. So, um, why IOJS? Um, I wrote a blog post about this, but yeah, uh, <laughs> because well, it was obvious. 
a couple months ago that all of the Node.js devs, so there's like some split, and all the most of the people who worked on Node.js as developers ended up starting IOJS. So all the development was being done on IOJS, and Node was just stagnating. And so I, it was pretty clear that if you wanted performance improvements and bug fixes, we ran into an issue with uh, like TLS wrap leaking memory, so and that got fixed in IOJS. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that was a, a big one for us. And a lot of just instrumentation and useful stuff. Uh, and the community is much more responsive because devs can, you can like chat with them on IRC and they'll go fix an issue or something instead of crickets. Uh, so yeah, that's the main reason we switched was it was clear that that was the future and it had some critical bug fixes for us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, um, so another question from chat is, uh, does Blue Beats integrate with Git? Not yet. I mean, we we run in, like we use Flubits to develop Flubits. So we like my you know my co-founder and I we both work like remotely uh, and we just spend all of our time like video chatting and then typing in Sublime Text and sharing our terminals and stuff uh, in Flubits. And it's really annoying when I commit something and push it and the other like Matt sees like local modified files and if he tries to pull, of course you'll get there like these files have local modifications, please stash them or, you know, get rid of those modifications. Mm -hmm. Uh, We, it's really annoying how, uh, like, uh, since Git is distributed version control, it's not an easy problem to solve. So for example, like, let's say we both have a branch checked out, but we can call the branch different things locally and then push to a different, a remote. So like, I can have some feature branch and call it one thing and you know, somebody else can call it another thing and then Flubits would have to figure out that, oh, these are really the same branch even though there's no, it would have to like inspect the .git you know, uh, mm-hmm. for, file format to figure that out. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. So for now, we mostly just say like stash, pull, stash, pop, and Git will merge that. And as long as nobody changed files during that very short window, uh, then you're you're both up and running with the same. You, your Git looks the same, and then your files look the same. But yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's a big annoyance, and I I wish Git had an easier way to get at the like the internals to figure out what which branch you're on and which commit you're at and all that. Okay, um, let me check if there is chat. Um, uh, another question from chat. Uh, is there a way uh, to go back in time with code like better control? See. Yeah, like um, a timeline where you could just, or t- like almost like time machine on a Mac, where you just like click back and bam, you're in that state. Uh, no, but like we could do that. We just haven't had time to write that. So right now, you know, we, somebody types and uh, our plugin generates a patch and sends it to the server, and the server takes that patch and applies it, and then throws it away. But it could save those in a big log, and then you could play them. Uh, you you play the the inverse patch uh, to go back in time. So Subversion uses this uh, to make to that's how you check out older stuff in Subversion. Uh, it's a pretty efficient way to save uh, changes. So you save like the current state and you save reverse diffs uh, so that you can go back in time. But we just haven't had time to to build it yet. Mm-hmm. Another feature that I really want. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so do you want? To, so if you are going. To, okay. So when you. Um, okay, when you uh, implement this feature, I'm going to implement it using Subversion, so mm. it will be, or not, or just some other thing. No, uh, the, okay. that's just the, it's the pattern that I just gave Subversion as an example, but the pattern's used oh, in other okay. uh, software, uh, the reverse diff thing. I forget um, what the official name is. So. Okay, makes sense. Um, so, okay, as usual, we've taken more questions from chat. Um, so, okay, the question about the team: How many people are working on Flubits right now? Uh, just three. Just three. So, pretty small. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and what's your experience with uh, working uh, remotely and with the whole distributed team? I imagine that it, if it's small, that then there is less. Uh, problems that arise when you, your team is bigger, but still, some people believe that uh, stupid teams are 
not as efficient and some believe that uh, it's like commuting is crazy and yeah yeah um, so for our team, like we're really small and we already knew each other in person beforehand. So it's not a big deal. Like it's really easy for us to work remotely. Mm-hmm. Uh, other, we've had some experience with our, like we have customers that have more than three people and it's interesting to get like their, uh, you know, take on remote work. And I think, um, like it, it can so the main reason it's it's not it can be less efficient is you often don't have the social pressure of other people can see your screen or they can see you and they can know that you're slacking uh, and so if, if you eliminate that social pressure also um, remote work sometimes it's hard to get a hold of people like maybe you can ping them on instant messenger but it's not the same as as video chat and uh, until recently like bandwidth hasn't been good enough but i think over time like all of these uh problems with remote work are going to be fixed uh and they're going to be fixed by software like right now we have you know cameras and microphones and high bandwidth internet links and so this this seems like purely a software problem because there's no reason for programmers to like be in the same room like you're not you're not working on some machine together you're you're communicating with each other and you're writing software together and and that that's pretty much it so there's there's no like there's really no reason to be in the same room uh except for the fact that current software doesn't make you as productive as being in the same room mm-hmm. but i i think there are also advantages that people don't notice like your employees don't have to live within 20 miles of your office uh you can hire people and you can hire people overseas and not worry about like visas and stuff. That is a huge pain. Uh, so I, I think more and more often people remote work will become more acceptable assuming the software gets better. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm making, and you're making this much more uh, easy and you're helping people to work remotely much more easily, right? Yeah. Um, the specific case is, uh, that we try and solve is, um, yeah, pair programming. Um, because, uh, right now if you want to work, like if you want to pair program remotely, uh, your only other choices are to use like some web based thing like cloud nine or, or nitrous IO. And like, I don't know about you, but I use my text editor a lot and I have it highly customized. Uh, and I hate switching text editors. Yeah. So, it, it, it basically those those web based things are like toys to me. Like they're not they're not real text editors. I can't use them as fast, and it's it's just annoying. So, we mostly like our, our like whole thing is you know developers pretty much marry their editors. So, you you should integrate with that, and so uh, we're we're trying doing all right. Like we've got Sublime Text pretty solid and IntelliJ is probably our best uh, plugin. So and that's like PyCharm and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and yeah, and, I, yeah I, we're slowly, slowly getting on others. Yeah, yeah I actually agree. I mean, uh, like when I tried all these uh, things, I don't remember about the other things you mentioned. I, I tried Cloud9 um, that you mentioned. And yeah, I agree. I mean, Fluvits is probably the best uh, tool for uh, like this for real-time collaboration. Um, so, because, yes, because they are all way based and uh, the whole, like, what I liked about Fluvis is this editor, um, editor thing that, that I can use, edit using my favorite editor. Um, yeah. So, okay, let's, add, okay, there were some questions in chat and I guess it's time to not ignore them, to stop ignoring them. Uh, Okay, so how is your experience with doing a startup like Fullbeats? Um, it's a lot of work. I had no, and it's not it's not fun work most of the time. It's just pure drudgery. Like, uh, yeah, just like fixing like some customer is like, oh, I'm having this problem, and often it's like, well, the problem is like you don't know enough about this to get it working right, and I can't say that. I have to just walk them through it. Uh, so it's it's taught me a lot of humility. Like I can't just normally as a developer, I'd be like, oh, I don't care about you. But if somebody is, you know, if they're a customer and they're paying you money, you have to be you have to be a little <laughs> little nicer to them. 
Okay. And, so yeah, that, that's the biggest difference. Is it's a lot of work, and dealing with customers is very different when uh, the money like connection is obvious. Uh, mm-hmm. Like if you work at a big company and some customers like you know the uh, it's usually like very indirect. So some some customer complains to some support person, and the support person like collects all of that information and tells developers. And it's very like abstract and you don't get there's no human feel to it at that point from a the developer's perspective. They just get a ticket and they don't notice that there's a human being behind that who's angry or frustrated uh at your software that you wrote. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um and another question. Uh are you planning on getting funding? Um Flubits was part of Y Combinator in the summer of uh twenty thirteen. So we we got funding. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, the next question is from chat is just Vim uh, question mark. But I assume this is uh, was a question about integration with Vim. Yeah, that was uh, that's been a, a, a deal for a while, uh, an an ordeal for a while. Sorry. Uh, so back in twenty thirteen, like mid twenty thirteen. We thought, well, let's build Flubits for a Flubits plugin for Vim, and that ended up like normal Vim. We don't like doesn't have the plugin API parts that we need to you know create a persistent connection and you know react to events on it. Uh, so we tried to submit a patch to Vim that added uh, basically as- some asynchronous plugin APIs, mm-hmm. and it was like six weeks back and forth with Fram Willinar. And we we just kept saying like, okay, what what's what do you want us to do basically, and uh, to fix you know we fix various bugs or uh, anyway he eventually said no and he wouldn't say why and he just dropped it, and so that was like six weeks of work for me and my co-founder and we're just like ah oh, seriously like just tell us at the beginning I'm not you know you're not going to merge this and I'll, I'm fine with that like uh, but then NeoVim came along mm-hmm. uh, and so. I definitely backed that bounty source, and I like NeoVim has an asynchronous plugin API. Uh, actually, our plugin for it right now is—I uh, don't think it works because they just changed that plugin API. Uh, they move pretty fast, and uh, they don't always inform people about changes to the stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think NeoVim is basically the future, and most of the time our plugin works. But they they just change the plugin API. So sorry, I think it's busted right now. It might be like five lines to fix it. I I just haven't looked into it yet. So I've been busy okay. with other stuff. Um, speaking about NeoVim, there was an episode with uh, Justin and Kiss, who is uh, one of the people working on uh, NeoVim. So if anyone, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm just mentioning this to people in chat. Um, although there were some technical issues, uh, in case, but I'm sure it's just in case you want to hear a bit about NeoVim. So, um, yeah. So, okay, how, okay, the question is, uh, my next question is, how do you develop Flubits using Flubits? Um, what, what text editors you are, are you using? Um, how do you collaborate? How many... How many hours you spend uh, doing pair programming, and how many hours do you spend doing um, like single solo. person programming? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So how do so how do we use Flubits to develop it? Like uh, th- at first, you know, Flubits didn't exist, so we had to be in the same room, and you know, we both just Matt, Matt and I just used Sublime Text because uh, that was the first one we first. That's what we both used, and we wanted that one to be our, our first plugin. Uh, so whenever we looked at each other's, like as soon as we got the, the text sync working, uh, we noticed that we look at each other's screen a lot when we're pairing. Uh, and so things like you'll point, like if you're pairing, you point and say like, "Oh, this code right here," and that doesn't work when you're not in the same room. Uh, so basically, whenever we looked at each other's screens, we thought that's a defect. We need to figure out a way to not have that, like. To make that work in software, so like selections and stuff. So if I select text, it gets highlighted in the other person's editor, th- that sort of thing. Uh, but now, when we use Flubits to develop Flubits, because our plugins work, uh, 
it's mostly uh, just straight up. It's just like pair programming in person, except I get to use my editor and uh, like Bjorn, our first employee, he gets to use his, his IntelliJ or whatever. And I don't have to, uh, like if we're in person, it's usually one computer and you have to choose which editor. And like my eyesight's pretty good, so I have tiny fonts and other people complain about that when I pair in person. <laughs> Like and then I have to make my fonts huge and I can't see as much code on the screen. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then what editors do we use? I use Sublime Text. Matt uses Sublime Text and Emacs. Bjorn uses uh, well now NeoVim and IntelliJ. Uh, I think I might switch to Atom at some point in the future when Atom's performance gets better. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, what was the last bit of that question? Uh, Besides... I think it was how many uh, time to spend. Uh, oh yeah, um, probably like f- anywhere from zero to four hours a day pairing, uh, <laughs> depending on what's going on. Uh, well, sometimes more than that. Uh, and then yeah, solo programming. Uh, you know, the same deal. Yeah, probably. Uh, I probably spend. I used to have rescue time on this computer, and I spend about ten hours a day on this the single computer and most of that time has been working so yeah mm-hmm. okay um hmm. uh, um anything else <laughs> yeah actually yeah okay so a bit I have some questions about um technical challenges like uh what's i mean you already mentioned uh, dealing with customers, but it's not quite technical challenge. But it's but it was interesting to hear. Um, I didn't expect that. But uh, the question is about technical challenges. Like, um, what are they? Yeah, there there are many because yeah. um, so the one that always bites us is latency. So if you are on a like really high latency link and you're still wanting to pair like. It's it's really slow, um, and, and what will happen is like somebody will change one line, and somebody will somebody else pairing will change that same line, and because of latency, you know those get to the server at very different times, and the server has to figure out oh these these are actually like I need to merge these, I need to discard one, uh, that sort of thing uh, of like editing the same line at the same time on a high latency link. That's just always been a problem for us. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done a better job over time of just like making our stuff smarter. So uh, uh, let's see, like getting into the technical details, we have these like checksums of whenever you're sending a patch, we're saying we're, the file is going from this state, this, you know, from this checksum to this checksum, and here's the transformation of like insert here and you know delete this and whatever. Uh, and then the server will keep old copies of the buffer state. So it based on the ch- keyed by the checksum. So it'll be like, oh, I've got this checksum. It's from like 10 seconds ago. I can apply that patch. And then it's it's almost like a git rebase uh, where you apply the patch to the old mm-hmm. version and then apply all subsequent patches. And if there are any conflicts, you have to deal with those in various ways. But then everybody gets the like the buffer in the state that they want, basically. It's like got all the transformations applied. Uh, so that, yeah, that was a big technical challenge. Uh, just, yeah, that, that's, mm-hmm. there's a reason very few people write operational transformation code. Uh, it's like, it's, it's a giant pain. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, question from chat. How hard was design, uh, was design uh, bits, and how was the design changed since you have been coding? Um, like designing the website. Oh man, I wonder what Wayback Machine has. Uh, like our first, like it, it used to be really hideously ugly, and because I have no design uh, expertise. Like if you look at my website, it's just like white background, black text, like no layout or anything. Once and that. So it looks uh, very hipster. It has a very hipster look, very minimalist. So it's not just some random Arial font, it's just some cool font. And I think I chose Baskerville because I saw a study that people who read 
like like out of all of the different fonts, it's the most convincing. That is, people who read Baskerville <laughs> read a text in Baskerville are more likely to believe it. So I'm like, I will make my site Baskerville. Uh, but besides that, I have no design experience. And as soon as we contracted work out to a designer, it improved our website tremendously. Uh, another very useful thing we did was just watching somebody try and set up Flubits. Like we, like we wrote it ourselves and we we're using it and then we're like, all of our, like we're not getting very good adoption and users are complaining about stuff or they're getting stuck. Like you could see them drop off, uh, in the analytics, like when they try and do, you know, something in the setup process. And so we thought like, let's just watch somebody set this thing up. And like, no, we just don't tell them anything. We're just like, here's Flubits, please set it up. And we just watch them. And that is a really good way to like notice how bad you are building user interfaces. Because uh, yeah. they'll get stuck and it's like, oh, this is obvious now. Like it didn't, it never occurs to you because you know about all of, all of the, you know, how everything should work because you wrote it. Uh, but watching users like completely uninformed try and set up your software will really help you uh, find all the places where you know, the setup process is confusing or annoying and you can fix them then. So that, that definitely changed how our UI looked. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking about architecture, did you have it figured out uh, initially or uh, did, you had to, did you have to significantly change it from the, from the first few months? Um, no, we, we pretty much... Like we changed some of the protocol, uh, but like the the underlying idea of we have a persistent network connection. We send transformations across. We get transformation from the, from a central server. That's that's been the same the whole time. Uh, we just tweak the format and stuff, uh, and then like we've had to change the backend architecture to scale. Uh, and that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, speaking about backend, how many servers do you have? Like. Uh I don't know. Uh, probably like a little over a dozen. Uh, okay, so that is quite a bit of a lot. Interesting. Um, I mean, they're they're like on EC2, so they're mm -hmm. not like you know for you rack mount servers. Like that'd be a whole cage. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think. Do I have? Questions. I have a bunch of open-ended questions, um, like quite right open-ended is, although some of them are less open-ended. So uh, the first one is like, um, what was your biggest bug when you were writing Flubits? Like the most detrimental, uh, the most like, I don't know, um, the biggest. I don't know, biggest. Okay. So. I'll just give one story because, like, that was the one that annoyed the most users. Let's go with that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, it turns like I've known this for a long time, but uh, I never like applied that knowledge to Flubits. But Windows and Unix have different new lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, Windows has uh, like CRLF, and I think uh, Unix systems for text files they just have a line feed. Mm -hmm. So. In Flubits, we're syncing these buffers, and if one guy's on Windows and one person's on Unix, like you know, OS 10 or Linux or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, it's not. It was not fun because like they kept inserting like a, a jillion new lines uh, back and forth. Uh, it was crazy. Like it, they would just completely corrupt the buffer, and I didn't notice because I never used Windows, and none of us used Windows at the time. So like our users would complain about corruption. And it took us a while to figure that out. And so we, we finally did. We built, like, in the server, it translates back and forth uh, between the... So everybody sees only their type of new lines. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we also had a bug in that where uh, if you execute a regex in JavaScript, um, if you don't use the... Re like, we, we didn't have slash g on the regex substitution, so it only changed the first new line. And our test case was only one line long, so <laughs> oops, yeah, that was that was a good one, uh, and we, we you know we eventually fixed it, but yeah, that one that was a big bug. It annoyed a lot of users. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, how many hacks like that do you have in your architecture? I mean, speaking about new lines. Um, I mean, it's clearly a hack. I mean, it's uh, it's a necessary, but well, it's a hack. Nevertheless. Yeah. Uh, that, I think that's the only big one. Uh, the one that I haven't implemented yet. There's a branch for it uh, in our server code. But that's uh, tabs versus spaces. Mm -hmm. So people have different indentation rules, and if they use tabs and the other person uses spaces, that's a very pernicious problem. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, um, and okay, what are the current features that I'm working right now? Um, so like just better support, like. Fixing uh, issues in our plugins, so that's mostly right now. That's Atom, uh, Sublime Text, and IntelliJ. Like I said, are pretty solid, and so Atom and NeoVim, those are the two that we need to clean up still. Uh, so that's in the pipeline. And one feature that we've been working on for a while is making Flubits useful for solo programmers as well, and not just pair programmers. So um, I think we'll call it like Flubits Pro, uh, but it's basically like. If you get stuck and you're writing code, like you're writing code and you're like, you get stuck and you're, you don't know what the bug is, and, or maybe you're learning some new framework or API, mm -hmm. and you can either, your choices then are like, go you know, look up documentation, spend maybe hours on Stack Overflow, or like you ask a question on Stack Overflow and you just wait for, you know, the response, like an answer. Uh, so th this is going to be a thing where you can just hire help. Like you can mm -hmm. just pay somebody money and you get them within a few minutes to help you with this problem. Something like and, one code me answer that you also like that. That was just so uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, but it in your editor. So this is that's actually hand, cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, because that way the files are like synced locally and like you get to use your editor. And there's the constant temptation while you're using your editor. If you ever get stuck, like I could just throw some money at this problem instead of wasting <laughs> like getting frustrated for hours. Uh, but yeah, though that's the feature that we've been uh, working on the most. Um, but it'll probably be—I'm not sure when—like a few weeks at least before we have like, before it's ready. Yeah, because uh, there's a lot um, in terms of like you know making sure that payments, like yeah, you know, all kinds of payment stuff that you want to get right because uh, mm -hmm. you can really annoy users if you don't get that right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. I found another question in my uh, list, which is um, so I have never dealt with uh, editor CPI. Uh, is I mean, how difficult is it? Like, I mean, you're writing by bits and it has to work consistently, consistently well across multiple editors. Yeah. So how challenging is it? Extremely. Uh, if I had known it was this much work, I would have only focused on like one or two editors uh -huh. because uh, so every editor API is buggy except for Emacs. Emacs <laughs> is the only editor that we have not found bugs in. Uh, so good, good job, Emacs people. You, you can pat yourself on the back for that one. Uh, so Sublime so, so Text was a big problem because uh, so it it's it's a uh, API is all Python. So, um, but in Sublime Text two, it's a version of Python two, and in Sublime Text three, it's a version of Python three. And your plugin has to run in both, so you have to write the subset of Python two and three that works in both. But there's also issues where, on some platforms in Sublime Text, uh, some Python modules are broken. So if you import SSL you'll get an exception and your plugin will crash mm -hmm. uh, on, but only on Linux and only on certain versions of Sublime Text. So that's really annoying. Like, you, how do you test for that? You can't unless you like, just set up a ton of Linux systems with Sublime Text and like, hope mm -hmm. you got the ones. Uh, so, a lot, uh, so the thing that helped us the most was automated crash reports. So if our plugin crashes, uh, it sends like, a trace back to us and that then we usually notice when when things are busted uh, on some odd platform. Uh, but yeah, plugin APIs are really buggy, and the plugin developers are very slow to fix these bugs. 
So I think the SSL issue is still an issue, and I opened it like two years ago for Sublime Text. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah. Mm. I do have plans for integrating something like virtual machines and stuff like that, because I know some of those. Sources. Yeah, uh, yeah, like Nitrous does definitely, and, and I think Cloud9 does as yeah. well. Uh, we don't have plans to do that. It's uh, it's a lot of infrastructure, and most people have like I think it's more useful for developers to have the code running on their machine locally and be able to share that state somehow with the people they're working mm -hmm. with, as opposed to like there's this shared VM and then you need to have internet access to get to it and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I would prefer that if Flubit stops working, you at least have your local dev setup working. Uh, and and you're not just completely stuck as if like you know like on days when GitHub is down or something you're like oh yeah. I can't do work now I'm done uh, I don't want that to be the case for Fluvits like at least you could still work by yourself. Mm -hmm. This makes sense. Um, okay. Um, yeah, let me check the chats. Um, team chat. They have any messages. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm running out of messages, so, oh sorry, I'm running out of questions, I have a few more, but if you'd like to ask some questions, uh, you need to do it now, because we will end the stream in a few minutes, or like in 10 minutes, I don't know. Okay, I have some questions, and no more questions, okay, there were open ended questions, and there are people who are just starting to learn programming, and uh, what advice would you give to people who are just starting to learn who don't have uh, professional experience and basically no ISIS? I have no idea. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe just go like find somebody who knows about code or something. I, maybe that would have helped me. I don't know. Like my, my dad uh, is a systems administrator so, and he has a computer science degree. So I'd, I'd ask him questions a lot and that really helped. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. so find somebody who knows more about technology than you and constantly pester them. I think that's that's the, the best advice I can give. Uh, okay, surprisingly, I ask this question in every episode, and uh, every person di gets different answer. So this is surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, What's your favorite editor slash IDE? I guess Sublime Text, but it's it's not that I really have a favorite. It's just that mm -hmm. it's the most tolerable of all of them. Uh, yeah, uh, I think Adam has the potential to be a really, really good editor. Uh, it, for, I mean, for example, because Adam is a browser, it has WebRTC built into it. So you mm -hmm. can, like, we've got a prototype where you can just video chat in Adam and it's really cool. Like, I don't have all these windows open. It's like I've got this one editor that's doing everything, but yeah. it's really slow still, and it's it's still pretty buggy. So, I think it'll get there though. I'm really hopeful about Adam, and also I'm hopeful about NeoVim because it could really improve the lives of Vim users because of its asynchronous plugins. Okay. Um... Okay, um, let me check my list. Actually, I don't know, I think that I have no more questions. This is surprising, oh, cool. yeah. Uh, okay, let me check chat. So, okay, you have one last chance to ask a question um so so yeah i don't know i guess i can come up with another one um okay okay another open -ended question which is what's your best story about uh blue bits i don't know again super open-ended i i don't know how to define the best so it's up to you okay so um i started blue bits with my co-founder Matt in mm. fall of 2012, and I quit my job at Rackspace then. But Matt kept working, and I applied to Y Combinator in the fall, mm. and 
like they didn't even give me an interview. And then in the spring, we applied again, and they gave us an interview, but I had also booked a vacation to Japan at the same time. I was so sure I was not going to get an interview that I was like, Ooh, yeah, I'll go to Japan. Like, uh, And so the times overlapped, and so I had to cancel. Like, I thought, like, okay, so an interview is like maybe a 20% chance of getting in. Uh, and they give you very, like I'd heard that they give you very useful advice and they give you money, which is nice. Uh, and, and well, they give you money for a percentage of your company. Uh, and, and so I'm like, well, it's like a 20% chance. The expected value is positive. So I, I dropped the Japan trip, like, you know, got a refund on my like hotel reservations and, mm-hmm. and like, you know, plane tickets and all that. And I thought it's really going to suck if I don't get in because like we're, we're going to, like I'd have no Japan trip and no Y Combinator. And so, but we went, uh, we did the interview. It was like 10 minutes long, really fast paced. And they tell you, they call you the, the evening, like 5 PM. And so by the time I'd driven back to San Francisco, uh, yeah, they, they gave me a call and they're like, you're in. And I'm like, yes. Uh, so yeah, that was probably the best one or I guess it, uh, the other one would be pitching for demo day. Uh-huh. Uh, so, like we, like I'm not a very good like public speaker. Uh, I'm not very extroverted, and so I, uh, the week before demo day in Y Combinator, they give you uh, you, you do practice interviews. Uh, or sorry, practice demo days, practice mm-hmm. presentations in front of the class and stuff. And uh, that was uh, yeah. I, I gave my little pitch and. Somebody like uh, said, like, this is so bad I cannot even criticize it. Like in front of the whole group of like a hundred people, and I'm just like, Ugh. Um, so then every single day for the next week, like we went down to Mountain View and practiced and revised uh, and just yeah kept improving it. And so that on demo day, like everyone's like, that's solid, yeah. Uh, but it was, I was amazed at how like how much that just like I don't know just hurt internally like just getting shamed in front of everybody like um, but it helped improve it helped me improve so it was worth it okay wow those are very interesting so so okay let me check this one more time okay okay Um, well, okay, I guess I'm, I ran out of questions, I ran out of questions, and there are no questions in chat, so cool. I guess we will end the stream now. Okay, um, unfortunately there were some weird technical issues with YouTube, uh, so I w- wasn't able to stream there. Um, typically there are some, you know, like a few people who watch there for some reason, even though YouTube is horrible for live streams. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because there is very poor discover capabilities. Uh, anyway, so I will upload the video uh, because I was recording it and, uh, and I'm still recording it and it will be available in like one hour and it will cool. be recorded there. Anyway, um, okay, no questions. So uh, thank you very much for these uh, streams. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, uh, thanks for having amazing me. amazing to talk to you. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, Thank you, people on Watchfish. Thank you, people on Watch Pro Code. Um, see you probably next week. Um, and yeah, we are in the stream, the recording will be available on YouTube. And yeah, so, hi, stop. So, sorry, bye.